Good morning and welcome to St Ninian's. Well, not to St Ninian's exactly. Welcome to St Ninian's Manse and its study. I, I, would, I wanted to bring this broadcast from the sanctuary itself, but unfortunately, due to a technical hits, hitch, I've been unable to do that. Um, however, here we are in the manse, and maybe in future weeks we will be able to broadcast this morning's worship, the morning worship service on a Sunday at 10.30 from the sanctuary. So a warm welcome to everyone this morning, but a particularly warm welcome to you if you are visiting us online here at St Ninian's. It's love you, lovely to have you amongst us for worship. Please don't just stay for worship, though. Why don't you stay also for a time of fellowship and for tea and coffee? Tea and coffee can be found in your kitchen. At the end of the service, go through to your kitchen, put the kettle on, pour yourself a cup of tea or coffee and come back through here. Pick up the phone and phone a friend. Wish them peace, ask how they are and tell them about this service. This service is pre-recorded. In future weeks, it might be able to go out live, but for this week, it is pre-recorded. So you can pause it at any time and rejoin us uh, at your leisure. You might want to do that now if you want to download the audio of service, which is on the website. You can download the audio of service there and attached to the audio of service, there are notices, intimations. <coughs> Please take some time to have a look at these. You will see that most things are cancelled. However, many things are continuing or starting up. For example, these worship services are continuing. And during the weeks to come, we will be opening the sanctuary on Wednesdays and Thursdays between 11 and 12 for a time of quiet prayer for sanctuary. And I'll be there uh, during these hours as well. So the church is open during the week on Wednesdays and Fridays between 11 and 12. Usually at this point in the service we would turn to each other and offer each other a sign of peace, of peace be with you. And um, obviously it's more difficult to do that when we're in our own homes. But if there is anybody who is with you, take the opportunity now to turn to them and say, Peace be with you. On Sunday mornings during Lent, we have been beginning our worship with a hymn by singing a psalm, the psalm for the lectionary, the appointed psalm from the lectionary. This is the fourth uh, Sunday in Lent, and the psalm for this morning is the 23rd psalm. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to read it. The 23rd Psalm The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. Let us pray. God of salvation, through your prophet, recorded in your book of Isaiah, you said to your people, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. God of promise, we know that you are not a God of condemnation, or a God who wishes to destroy. Nor are you a God that wants to bring ill to this world, and we who live in it. We know you as a God of love, a God who builds up, 
a God who seeks to repair and reconcile. In this season of Lent, as we travel on the road of suffering with you to the cross, we see around us a broken world that is separated from you. We do not live in your spiritual kingdom yet. We live in a physical, material world which is no garden of Eden and where things happen that are beyond our control. Life for us in this world is often a painful struggle and a hardship filled with worry and fear. But you wish us to find our way through this life with you and to you. You long for us to live life in all its fullness. And so in the season of Lent, we follow you on the road to the cross. For by following you, we find the way of love that suffers for others, and by so loving, sets us free. Open our eyes that we may see. In this material world, Lord, separated from you but longing to follow and find you, there have been times when we have not lived as we should have. We have been selfish when generosity would have been wiser and kinder. We have been suspicious of the intentions of others when trust would have brought us together in love. We have been hurtful with our thoughts and actions when grace in our assumptions and peacefulness in our actions would have smoothed and strengthened this rocky, winding road of life that we live together with others. This morning, we are far apart from each other and from you. We pray that through our worship, your Holy Spirit will bring us closer to each other and to you as a community of your people. Make us one body living in this broken world, but looking for your kingdom and following the example to us of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us not to fear this world, but to love you, ourselves and one another, and to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. The first reading this morning is from the Gospel of John at chapter 9 and verses 1 to 41. The Gospel of John at chapter 9. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his, eye, and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask the man how he had received his sight. The man said to them, 
He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, They called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that that man is a sinner. The man man born blind answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to be his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I come into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees knew him, heard this, and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Amen. Now, are there any children here this morning? Are there any children with you this morning? If there are, if there are, that's great. If not, I'd just pop through to where they might be, playing in another room, ask them to come through. Um, and uh, and to listen to this talk. So are there any children here? If there are, put your hand over your eyes. What do you see? Put your hand over your eyes and tell me, what do you see? Now, keep your hand over your eyes and imagine that I asked you to hold your hand over your eyes and to run around the room. Hold your hand over your eyes and run around the room. Now, what just happened? 
Now what just happened? Take your hand from your eyes. Take your hand from your eyes. Sometimes in our lives, there are things that we don't understand. Sometimes there are times when we don't know what's going to happen next or what to do about a situation or a friendship. Sometimes in life, it feels like we can't see and that we are running around banging into things. This morning, we read a story about Jesus meeting a man who was blind. Everyone thought that it was the man's fault that he was blind, or if not his fault, then it was the fault of his parents, perhaps. Jesus showed them that the man didn't need to be blind, that if only everyone opened their eyes to see how he, Jesus, lived, then this man would be healed. There are times in life when we don't know, when we don't understand, when we can't see. But if we open our eyes to how Jesus lived, and if we love God and our neighbours as we love ourselves, then we will discover the power of God to overcome our blindness. In this world, there is already a cure for sickness. We just have to find it. In this world, there are people who have amazing abilities to do amazing things. We just have to believe that we can do them. In this world, there are people who need our help. We just have to believe that we can help them. If we believe, if we follow the way Jesus lived and love God, love ourselves and love our neighbours, we will be able to see that once we were blind, but now we can see. Let us pray. Loving God, you help us to see in this world. There are many times when we struggle to understand what's going on or to build relationships. But by following Jesus, you open our eyes to the future. You open our eyes to other people. You open our eyes to this world. And you help us to live in it, no matter what darkness surrounds us. Open our eyes so that we can say, once we were blind, but now we see. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn. Um, we're not going to sing it, um, although you may wish to if you want, but I'm going to read it through because the last thing you want is to hear my singing voice. The hymn is hymn number 351. It's called Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands. It's hymn 351, Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands. Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands doing good for all, to all, healing pain and sickness, blessing children small, washing tired feet and saving those who fall. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all. Take my hands, Lord Jesus, let them work for you. Make them strong and gentle, kind in all I do. Let me watch you, Jesus, till I am gentle too till my hands are kind hands, quick to work for you. The second reading this morning is from the book of Ephesians, at chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. 
Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Amen. Let us pray. Send your Spirit among us, O God, as we meditate on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ together. By it, prepare our minds to hear your word. Move our hearts to accept what we hear. Purify our will to, be, to faithfully follow Jesus Christ in joy and faith. This we pray through the same Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. How did this happen? Why is this happening? What caused it? Who caused it? Who is to blame? We don't understand it and we can't see how we are going to fix this. Those were the questions that Jesus' disciples and everyone else in society in his day were asking about health problems that they didn't understand and couldn't see how to fix. Rabbi, they said to Jesus when they encountered a man who had been born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Why was he born blind? Blindness back then was a disaster for people and society. It impoverished people. It made a huge demand on families, amongst others in society, to help the person born blind. It caused an increased likelihood of mortality, of death. If people didn't die from blindness, they died from complications associated with it, albeit social ones. It wasn't just a social and an economic disaster. It was a medical disaster as well. No one knew why people were born blind and no one knew how to cure blindness. Amidst all these unanswered questions, all that confusion, and amidst the medical, social, and economic consequences of the condition, people were left to draw their own conclusions, find their own answers. The general feeling was that surely bad things can only happen to bad people, or if you like, become some sort of karma. If you're bad, then your children will suffer as a consequence. Or perhaps the world, the universe, God, had some way of seeking retribution against people who had done bad things as a punishment, or to teach people a lesson, or to, face, or to force people to follow the right way of living, and making people blind from birth was his way of doing it. Jesus was a clever debater. When the disciples asked him these questions based on those assumptions, questions that were impossible for Jesus to answer, why was this man born blind? How would Jesus know? Jesus didn't know. And who sinned, him or his parents? What a choice. When the disciples asked him these questions that were impossible to answer, as all clever debaters do, Jesus attacked the premise of the question rather than answering it directly. He said, in effect, that neither this man nor his parents were sinners. His blindness was not an act of God punishing or seeking retribution. Jesus knew that this world is a fallen world, that it is not perfect, that bad things happen in it, that people do bad things that medically, socially, politically and economically societies struggle to cope at all times, but particularly when faced with crises like blindness, for example. Jesus knew that God didn't cause the world to be the way it is. The world is the way it is because that is the price of freedom, of maturity, of growing up and being independent of not being the Garden of Eden where life is immature. The world and the life that lives on it can't live with and be protected by its parent for all its life. Who would want to live that way? The world, life and we have to grow up, make our own way, our own mistakes, live our own lives. For the world to be free to live, for life to be free, 
for people to be free, there has to be a separation to some extent from God, our parent. Jesus answered, it is not this man or his parents who sinned. He was born blind so that God's power might be displayed in curing him. Like any loving parent, when their children move out of home to make their own way in life, God does not stop caring for his children, for the life that he created. Like all loving parents, God does not want to be separated from the life that he created. God continues to offer love, help, direction, support, care and comfort when needed to his children. Like all loving parents, even if the life they created wants to make their own way in this world. That is how the power of God is expressed in this world. The power of God is not revealed in judgment, condemnation, fire, brimstone or a virus. What kind of a parent would that be? The power of God is revealed in love, reaching out, caring and healing and weeping and supporting. That expression of the power of God is what Jesus displayed and it confused many people who thought God was an angry God of retribution. We are still confused today. I read one comment this week reflecting on this global shutdown and the noticeable effect it has had on the environment. Clean rivers in Venice, vastly reduced air pollution, a significant decrease in the release of global warming gases, for example, that person, that, <coughs> that person suggested that the world was cleaning itself, that COVID-19 is the vaccine, that we are the world's virus. There are a few more horrible ideas. Human beings are not a virus. This is not something we deserve or should expect. We are not being punished for sin. God is not judging us. The situation, however, is something that is unprecedented, as everyone is saying. It is something that we don't fully understand. It is something that we don't fully know yet what to do about. Just like the disciples and the society of the first century who didn't understand and ask questions like how, why and what when confronted with blindness and its medical, economic and social consequences. So we are asking ourselves, why did this happen? What should we do? How is this going to end? For those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ and believers in our loving God, in the response to these questions, we need to believe that this is a time not for blaming people for doing wrong or abandoning them to their fate or pointing the finger of judgment, but rather for believing that the power of God can be displayed in curing our present troubles. Jesus answered, he was born blind so that God's power might be displayed in curing him. All around us, the power of God is being displayed in helping to cure our present situation. Healthcare workers risking their own health to cure others. Clever people working and thinking harder to find a vaccine and invite, invent other ways of providing healing. People looking out for each other in their communities. People coming together even if they can't physically be together to offer help, love and support. Governments leading, people debating, people working long shifts and responding rapidly. There are those who are being selfish, who are attributing blame, who see this as an opportunity to advance their own agenda or make a profit. But that is not the God of power at work. The power of God in the world is the power to believe that human beings can value all that this world offers us. That is to say, we can love God. The power of God in the world is the power to believe that human beings can value their own lives and what they can do and achieve in this world. That is to say, we can love ourselves. The power of God in the world is the power to believe that human beings can value the lives of other human beings so much that we are prepared 
to make huge sacrifices for others. That is to say, we can love our neighbours. The belief in loving God, that belief in loving God, ourselves and our neighbours, is the power of God in the world, transforming the world. When COVID-19 first hit the world, we were blind. That has caused enormous medical, social, political and economic upheaval. Blind we may have been, but this is not the time to accept that blindness and to ask who made us blind and why. Now is the time to believe in the way of Jesus Christ, that by loving God, that is, by believing the answers to this crisis already lie in the world around us, waiting to be discovered, and by loving ourselves, that is, by believing in the power of what we each have to offer the world at this time, and by loving other people, that is, by believing in the power of supporting and caring for others, we might be blind now, but we are beginning to see. One day, we too will say about this crisis, once I was blind, now I can see. Now to the one who can keep you from falling and set you in the presence of his glory, jubilant and above reproach to the only God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, power and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. The next hymn, which we're going to read, I'm going to read, you may sing if you wish, is hymn number 555, Amazing Grace. It's hymn number 555, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and potion be, as long as life endures. Normally, at this point in the service, we would uplift our offer offering. Perhaps you could set your regular offering aside to put in the plate when we return to worship services in the church. So in thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With a spirit of hopefulness, we give in commitment to God in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We continue our worship with our offering. Now let us bless the offering. Compassionate God, we offer you these gifts of our time, our labour and our lives as signs of our faith and obedience. Receive the offering we make and fill us with and fill us with fullness of life, that in the midst of death all creation might feast on your unending life. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bring to God our prayers for others and our prayers of thankfulness. Let us pray. Living God, we know that you are a God of healing, who longs to see your world made whole and our lives lived to the full. There is much in these days that we have to be grateful for. All around us there are examples of your love. There are people caring for one another. There are people who risk their health to help us stay in good health. There are people working longer, thinking harder, taking responsibility and showing leadership. Where would we be if not for them? Thank you, Lord, that you put love in our hearts, caring in our hands, and thoughtfulness for others into our minds. Gracious God, we are grateful that we live in a state where those who govern us are elected by us and who value our freedoms. But we know that there are places in the world where such freedoms do not exist or are under threat not just from the natural world 
but from the human one as well. We pray that your justice and your peace will reign in the hearts of all those in positions of power and authority, and that you will make us campaigners for peace and justice. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we are grateful that we live in a country where health care is taken seriously, not just the care of the youngest or the fittest, but the oldest and the most infirm also. We know that this is not the case everywhere, and not everywhere can afford the care we can. Help us to share our care as we give thanks for all those nurses, doctors, social care providers, and other health workers who even now in this crisis are working harder than they have, than they have ever done and putting their health at risk to ensure we are safe and that there is care for us when we need it. Give them, Lord, strength, fortitude, and courage to face the coming weeks. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we are grateful that we live in a country that has a robust, efficient, and a wealthy economy. Of all those who have ever lived, we live at a time and in a place that is probably the wealthiest. We are grateful for the blessings we have received by virtue of your birth that we did little to earn. But we know that even in the world's richest places, there are people who are amongst the poorest and people who even now in our families, communities, cities and country are feeling the worry of impoverishment. As our country struggles to contain the virus spreading around the world, we pray for those whose lives have been financially devastated by the measures we have had to put in place. Make us, we pray, a generous people, compassionate, kind and understanding. Give them, we pray, hope for the future, future and a light in a dark tunnel. Lord, in your mercy. Living God, while good health is something we value, we know that there are many today for whom good health is not something to take for granted. We pray for all those who are suffering illness today, particularly those who have contracted coronavirus. We pray for those who live in fear of it and what it might mean for them. We pray for those who have other health conditions, who worry over their treatment as we focus all our attention and resources on one health condition. We pray for those closest to us and those in our congregation and parish who may be struggling at this time. We pray for all those who are living in isolation. Give them strength, purpose, companionship and care, Lord, and inspire us to do what we can to relieve people's loneliness. In this time of silence, we bring to you all those whom we know who are in need of your love and our care today. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, we give thanks to you for the great community of faith into which you have brought us, for those who have kept safe our scriptures, gathered our songs, built our sanctuaries, and taught us to know and trust you. Grant us grace in our day to live as faithfully as they did, and to provide us generously for our children. Until you bring us, with all your people, into the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Oh man. People of God, go and claim the freedom that Christ has offered you. Once you were blind, now you see. By faith, may he enable us to serve the world together by his Holy Spirit and through our obedience to his will to transform the world around us. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We would sing our final hymn at this point in the service, but I shall read hymn number 132, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Hymn number 132. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, no wanting, no wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountain, mountains high soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, O oh, help us to see, tis only the splendour of light hideth thee. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all. Amen.